so I'm going to do this a little different from the other fireside chats to give you guys an opportunity instead of me talking more. But um, I asked Shauna, is, you're so kind to come all the way here. I, she just drove here from Chico Paradise area this morning for this. She was busy yesterday and tomorrow. And I was like, you know, this is one of those rare opportunities, though, where I really want you to talk about how you actually did something that's super cool that really does make a difference in people's lives. And it, this is like doing equity, doing sustainability. This is the doing of it. It's so, so important. And to see how, like, you know, um, inside of Fannie Mae, there is a real want and a desire to really make a real difference to have applied compassion. And so I wanted Shauna and um, Sidra to kind of talk to you about how they've been, what they've accomplished here, because it's really impressive and it's innovative. And so instead of me like sitting up and asking the questions, I'm hoping that they can really start to tell the story of how it came about. And then I'd like to leave about 10 minutes for questions. So if we can get through that in 10, and then 10 minutes from questions from you, okay? All right, oh, Shauna, I'm so sorry. You're going to have to in introduce yourself, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, so I just think you're very cool and I appreciate it. Thank you, all right. Um, so do you want me to outline the program and then you sure. talk more about kind of where it's going? Mm -hmm. All right. I am Sean O'Shaughnessy. I am with Community Housing Improvement Program, CHIP. We are an affordable housing developer located in Butte County and serve seven uh, counties in the north uh, region. We had a multifamily housing uh, project burn in the campfire. Uh, we were successful in rebuilding it through lots and lots of hurdles. And um, we've also been doing some home ownership rebuilding um, kind of in the region where campfire survivors are um, utilizing that both in Paradise and neighboring counties. Um, but so Sidra totally teased what we were going to talk about. <laughs> um, and so in it, and listening to people and the frustrations and how long it takes to rebuild and the type of housing and you know talking to Kate who does uh, disaster case management and who was getting left behind in the recovery and housing is one of the biggest barriers for recovery in all communities and it takes a really long time um, and rental housing renters don't have as much insurance or they might not have any insurance and their ability to recover after a fire, which you guys just branded really well, <laughs> we say it all the time, um, is very hard. And so Tim Carpenter, who isn't here, but works with Sidra and I were chatting a lot about, okay, what could, what could we do about this? What could we do about this problem? Because single family rentals don't come back. Multifamily rentals take forever to build because of funding and financing. Um, but single family rentals just don't come back. The landlords don't rebuild. It's not cost effective. It's a type of housing stock that is completely lost. So Tim was saying, well, what if we use our REO stock? So the folks who decided they weren't going to stay and kind of let their loans be foreclosed on and so we, we came up with an idea that we would do kind of two paths. We would buy some land from them and then we would buy completed homes from them. And then they got into this really creative funding, financing, lending um, that made it more possible because the loans are cheaper. So as Sidra was saying, they don't lend to nonprofits, they lend to people. And that's important because it's super cheap at the time, you know, <laughs> to borrow as a person as opposed to a nonprofit. So we also decided we were going to try a manufactured housing um, model using the Fannie Mae guidance of MH Advantage, which are uh, basically comparable to a stick built. They can be built to WUI standards, wild, wildland urban interface, um, and uh, would and could be financed uh, as a conventional loan. Um, and so we did that. And so we finished all six homes. So we did four purchases, two builds. This was very exciting. It was very it exciting. It was a very long time. It took a very <laughs> long time. We finished all of that kind of between January and March of this year. 
Um, and we have our first family in. The second one's moving in October 2nd. And uh, we probably wouldn't do manufactured housing again. Um, it didn't end up being a shorter timeline. It didn't end up being that much cheaper. Well, COVID happened in and the middle. And COVID did happen. <laughs> so that might have contributed to it a little bit. Um, and we were able to effectively change the guidelines for CDBGDR to do a scattered site, nonprofit owned single family uh, rental funding source in their multi, un, kind of under their multifamily housing stream of CDBGDR. So we got that done. They did the variance. Sidra will go into more details. And now we always built this with the idea of how do we take this nationwide? How do we serve other disaster impacted communities? And it's happening. So. Sure. So let me share a little bit more information about how mortgage financing on a single family side works and how it works on the multifamily side. So on the single family side, all our models are based on a credit score. You know, everyone knows what their credit score is or they know it, you know, roughly. When you're dealing with a nonprofit entity, you don't have that. So it was basically starting from ground zero. The second thing is our folks in single family and multifamily don't speak. <laughs> Literally, they, they, it's two different languages. It's two different ways of looking at mortgage finance, et cetera. One of the key things is on the multifamily side, and multifamily is four units or more, is that those four units must be a continuous property. So in Paradise, what most of the housing stock that was available for rentals and a lot of you know more uh, suburban or rural settings is single family homes. And so because those single family homes are not all located on one piece of property, they're scattered throughout, any multifamily loan would never work. It's just not designed to allow, even if you had, you know, 200 properties, it is not titled as one piece of real estate. So that is one key thing to be aware of. So what we were able to do is basically get our single family folks and our multifamily folks to talk and come up with sort of a new set of criterion in terms of uh, looking at, on the multifamily side, it's what is called the debt service coverage ratio. It's basically how much debt can an entity sort of cover with their inflows of cash? And that's very different than how sort of the multi, or sorry, single family, mo you know, our models work on the front end. We were able to close those six loans, uh, get them delivered to Fannie Mae. So it's like, as I said, Fannie Mae does not actually make loans. We worked with a small community bank, Tri-Counties, to do those loans and then get them delivered. And so just to give you an example of, how single family, multifamily don't work is I'm trying to get this variance now to be sort of permanent so it can be used nationwide. And talking with the single family folks, they're like, well, how does this debt service coverage ratio work? And I'm like, they're like, do you have anyone on the multifamily side who can explain it to us? They, they literally, it is speaking like, I don't know, French and English. It is just, it is a different language. It's a different way of looking at the world. So it's really sort of crossing those paths uh, within, you know, Fannie Mae or even a lender uh, to basically say we can make this work across these uh, divisions. And so that's what we're hoping to do is uh, by the end of the year is basically get this approved so that we can use it. So unfortunately, when, you know, something goes into our REO, it means it's been foreclosed upon. So the worst has happened to it. But we're hoping that we can now sell these homes, these, and basically get nonprofits to purchase them instead of investors for affordable rentals. And I think one of the key things, you know, some of the lessons learned from that was, uh, Shana said, uh, they use CDBGDR to help purchase and um, underwrite these homes. One of the things that we did not think about, we thought it was gonna be in the form of a grant. It was in a form of a 20 year loan, which is great. Um, th from our view, there's some good things about that because we don't have to monitor that. Uh, you know, the state of California will be monitoring that it's being used for affordable rentals, and that's they're using existing programs and standards and a process. We're not reinventing the wheel. But what it did cost us that we didn't think about was something called our com combined loan to value. So some, you know, folks who are, who are out there might know of loan to value. So basically, it's 
the amount of your loan versus the value of the property. And so we had designed everything for just one loan. So it would be our loan that and so we said it couldn't go over 80%. But we didn't think about, well, what if there's this sort of second loan, which was forgivable, it's a 0% interest rate, but it bumped that loan to value up to 105, which broke all our r rules in terms of what's allowed, particularly for an investment property. And so it's like, we, ha we allow that, particularly we call it, you know, for um, folks who are willing to purchase or, you know, uh, homeowners who are purchasing to occupy a home, we allow that combined loan to value to be up to 105 if that, you know, uh, second is being used to help for down payment assistance and a whole set of things. And it was like convincing our folks internally this is, that it's basically the same thing is that, you know, CDGDR, a federal program that's administered by the state of California, is saying we will supplement the purchase of this home the same way. It's forgivable, 0% interest. And so selling that to our folks saying, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So it's a lot of not reinventing the world, but at least sort of luring those lines. We broke all the rules. We broke all the rules. And, and, and it, <laughs> I mean, it's, we started talking about this at the end of 19... It was, so I joined the team in um, February 2020, okay. and Tim, I think, had already started talking to you, and he's like, Sidra, he make this work. He needed Sidra <laughs> to get it done. Uh, but, so, I mean, it's three years, three and a half years, but we changed almost all of the lending rules at Fannie Mae in significant ways that will benefit particularly rural communities mm -hmm. um, post-disaster. And it's really, I mean, it's a little technical, but it's super exciting. Um, for us, the underwriting didn't work to do like a full 80% uh, of the loan. We had to have more supplement to basically be able to keep the rents affordable. Um, so that is important, having a philanthropic partner or a source like CDBGDR to kind of balance with uh, the conventional loan. Um, but the conventional loan is cheaper than you would get normally. Still, even with 7% interest rate. Yep, exactly. Um, so it was, it's only six houses for us, but it kind of set a precedent of opportunity for the entire nation. And so we're pretty excited about mm -hmm. it. Um, and yeah, Sidra is a wizard getting it through and making uh, really hard parts of uh, lending law change. I love that. Okay, so we have a little over seven minutes for questions, and I assume that some of you are going to have questions or would like to see this immediately implemented in your own communities, however, so raise your hand. And please, if you have a nonprofit or a lender who would want to participate, come find me. Was it too technical? Is that what happened here? <laughs> Because I and can if you ask want to questions. talk about, I can talk about um, one of your favorite subjects, uh, which is uh, ma manufactured housing, <gasps> resident communities. Oh. oh, I can talk about community land trust. I know that was raised in I the back. Oh, home. I love that. And sweat <laughs> equity too. And again, if um, I'm here for the next two days, so if I can't cover it in the next six minutes and thirty three seconds, I do want to <laughs> let you talk about rocks. But um, when you said manufactured housing communities, one thing that does need to happen, and we were talking about insurance in the, the prior panel, is even though banks and the federal government uh, interprets MH Advantage in the Freddie comparison, which I don't know what they call it, um, but there's, as basically a stick-built home, it's not chattel, it's a stick-built home, insurance companies don't. Um, so it was very hard to find conventional insurance um, for these homes, we were able to insure two of them through State Farm before they pulled out of California, and then the rest are through California Fair Plan. Uh, actually, Sidra, maybe you could talk about uh, talent mobile estates. Is that something you're able to talk about? Um, so, uh, not talent mobile estates, but I can talk about sort of the model that we're trying to promote with resident-owned okay. communities. Okay, deal. That? Um, so one of the things that is unique with, uh, a manufactured resident owned community is we have gotten a, uh, I deal, as I already mentioned, I deal with a lot of lawyers, is that tax law has historically said if you have a co op, um, it has to be uniform. And, and what that means is basically 
the land and the unit have to be owned together, which is not how, if, fo if folks are familiar with uh, manufactured housing and resident -owned communities, that is not how those work. So what happens is the homeowner owns their unit separately, and then they will own a share that entire entitles them to the pad in which it resides. Historically, we have not been able to purchase those loans because of an IRS rule. I love our uh, lawyers. You know, they come, you know, they have different opinions. They change over time. And so they have changed their opinion in terms of this IRS law as to what is a acceptable co-op. And so if, and this is a big if, and so to the states where this can work, and we would love to pilot with anyone out there, and please reach out to me, is the state of California and Oregon, is that, um, as I think the child world word was used, if those um, manufactured housing, those MH units, are titled as real property, and it is in a resident-owned community, you can get conventional financing. And this is, you know, sort of breaking a lot of rules in terms of how the industry has looked at this historically. Um, but we are looking for communities um, that are willing to partner with us. It does not have to be necessarily a new community. You know, even though interest rates are historically high right now at 7%, unfortunately, they're still lower than a chattel loan, which could probably be, you know, two, three times um, what conventional financing is. So you're talking 9%. Probably a few years ago, I, I don't know. I haven't looked recently what they are right now, but it, it's it, and it's only twenty years for a chat alone versus a thirty year. So, um, yep. I have a question for you. So this is. I do, ha I do have a question when you're ready, Shauna. Well, no, I have a question. So, is this lending to a person who's purchasing mm -hmm. a home in a resident-owned community? Correct. Okay. So, so, so they can get they can get a conventional thirty-year mm -hmm. loan if they're moving into a manufacturer. That's awesome. Good. Hello. Um, I'm curious. You mentioned a lot of different programs, and maybe there's something out there. I'm I'm curious about given the current um, interest rate levels and how prohibitive that is for people facing disaster rebuild or finding homes to buy. Um, are there programs that you have or ways that we can model the SBA low interest function? to do kind of first time home buyer for displaced renters or others impacted by disaster that's below market rate interest rates? That's a really tough question. So you can use, we call it a, a community second, and which is basically how we were able to convince our uh, internal folks to view the CDBG DR loan. That community second can be used in a couple of different ways. One, it can be used for down payment assistance but it can also be used for interest rate buy-downs. And that gets a little bit more complicated. Um, Fannie Mae does not set interest rates, so I, I'll preface that first. So um, I wish there was a way to wave a magic wand and return the environment to that 3%, uh, but we're dealing in a different world. But that that is something um, there can be, and if um, I can point you, we have rules and how those seconds need to be structured. Um, it needs to be either through a nonprofit, a government entity. So it, it, it is possible to help with those interest rate buy-downs, but it has to be done in a much more complicated way than I can describe in the next minute. There is another source. I don't know about SBA, but if they are in a USDA rural community, the 502 loans are running below kind of market um, on their interest rates. So they're a little bit less um, if people, and people can, who are income qualified can borrow through the USDA for home purchase. We actually have five more minutes. That was not quite right. So hold on one second. We have two, I know two questions. So Julie first. So I, I don't know that it's a question. It's more of a project for all of us. Um, so, cause we're, we're, we're supporting some policy change in Georgia because the other challenge with manufactured homes, right, is that they don't appreciate. Because of the loan structure, it is more like a car loan structure, and so it is not that traditional. And so, and they don't have parameters within that financing that allows them to add anything besides the box that they're buying. Um, and we know, because of IBHS science, that manufactured houses can get to a level of fortified, right? So in high wind, tornado, and hurricane zones, 
we need them to get designated. Part of the cost problem there is the pad and the anchoring, which is cost prohibitive because it's not, we can't get it financed in the financing of purchasing, right? So I'm saying that all out loud because you know I won't remember this, um, that we need to all work, we need to put like a little task force or something because we're all working in manufactured housing at some level and we and I need your brains. Yeah, and I think one of the key things is we do on the multifamily side, purchase loans that are made to MH communities. Um, there is, you know, one of the things that has come up with wildfires is that intersection between the pad and the home is very complicated because, you know, we've seen this with wildfire communities where the concrete is no longer, you know, uh, Julie, what I, 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 what's the right word? It, it basically is worthless. I, I'm sure there is a engineering term for it. <laughs> it's compromise. Thank you. And so the idea of, you know, how, who pays for that is not always clear uh, with insurance. And, you know, so that is an issue, but yes, Bill. How's it going? I was just wondering, are the loans that um, are for the nonprofits through this program, are those deed restricted units or are they market rate units? You wanna? Well, yeah, well I'll know the part of it. So, uh, we did commit to Fannie Mae that we would rent them at an affordable uh, level. Um, Fannie Mae is not tracking what we do with it um, once we own it, but our other funding sources with CDBG, DR will. So um, I think that it is a requirement to get into the loan. Correct, and so there, are, we, Talking about deed restriction it, um, is a different area. We do not require for this loan a deed restriction on the property, um, which adds a whole other layer of complexity to the lending process. And I can talk to you about that as well. It's you know another form similar to a community land trust where it preserves that affordability uh, in perpetuity generally or for 99 years or some extended period depending on state laws. Um, so I can talk to you about how that could work, but that for this, it was not a deed restricted property. But we committed to keeping the rents affordable. Thank you. Real quick question on the, when the nonprofits are able to purchase the homes, is there ever a rent to own situation or the nonprofits just own it forever? So we had a conversation with Fannie Mae about that as an option. Um, and we are allowed through this program to resell, um, and we would income qualify the people at sale, but unless there's an additional source of funding, um, it's not deed restricted as in permanently affordable. They can gain all the equity they want at that point. So we can either do a rent to own option. So currently we're renting, we're seeing how that works. Um, we have talked about do we want to do a rent to own or convert them from rentals to single family home ownership if we hate managing single family rentals. Um, and both Fannie and uh, CDBGDR um, said that was okay. Um, CDBGDR would probably have a rent, uh, would have a deed restriction for a period of time, but, um, but yeah, it was maximally. Uh, flexible, um, which is also a weird right. thing for and people it, working in disaster recovery. And this was a test and learn. So we we, we did a lot, um, and we learned a lot. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things with, particularly at Fannie Mae, we can say we're, we're the worst has happened to a community, and so it's, it gives us a, a little bit of flexibility to test things out where folks may not normally want to take the risk. Um, you know, Fannie Mae, you will hear us talk a lot about risk management, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, these six properties, basically everything, I mean, Shauna's aware of this, like they burnt, they, they had been foreclosed on, then they burnt in the campfire and COVID happened. Then as we were trying to get the occupancy certificates, uh, historic rains happened so they could not dig the trenches to connect you know, the utilities, it was like delay after delay after delay. 
And so we learned a lot, both positive and negative, because of this experience. And I think that's what we're taking back so that we can you know, expand this nationwide. All right, please, a round of applause for Sidra and Shauna. Thank you.